I'm very pleased that this debate has been called and pleased to serve under your chairship. We so often hear in this place about the devastating impact that universal credit has on people's lives. And there's mounting evidence that shows that those struggling with the system and struggling to use it are not getting the help that they need. So I think it's very important today that we discuss some of those issues and look at how we can work to resolve them. It is the duty of the government to support those who are struggling on universal credit, include, including those who for many good and valid reasons are not able to access the digital element of universal credit. I get constituents in my office all the time, Mr Evans, who are struggling to access the online system for many different reasons, whether that's financial barriers, they might not have a smartphone or a computer at home, they may not have money to you know, get the bus to their local job centre or library, they may actually be closed down themselves. People with poor mental health, anxiety, disabilities, older people, people who are computer illiterate, and those with English as a second language. I do have to say that I, I met with the minister who's here today and I asked why uh, the universal credit system was only available in English because I have Syrian refugees in Midlothian who have struggled with the system because English is not their first language. The minister reassured me it wasn't only in English and that it was also available in Welsh. But I, I don't believe that that is helping people who, who really need that, that crucial support. According to Citizens Advice, these people who don't have online access are disproportionately likely to be disabled, to have a long-term health condition, or to be unemployed or on a low income. So therefore it's clear that the most vulnerable people will be the same people who will struggle to use a fully digital service and who will need that extra support. I, I will. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend Kim Wayne congratulate on securing the debate. And of course I at least do welcome that the helpline is now free, which of course it wasn't in the first place. But does my honourable friend agree with me that there are far deeper problems here, that actually the whole system needs to be looked at? Because certainly in my constituency, universal credit is driving up debt, driving up rent arrears and driving up poverty for those in work and indeed those out of work. Thank you for the, the very important point and I, I campaigned for the helpline to be made free um, and, and welcome that as well but he's right, the system is, is driving vulnerable people into hardship and they they must be given the right support and not rushed off the phone and directed to an online system. Yet in February, we saw from the leak of a deflection script that was being used in call centres that that is what was happening. People were being rushed, rushed online. To give way. And as well as the, 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 the challenges with universal credit that she's pointing out, does she also agree with me that digital exclusion is already becoming a significant problem under universal credit, with many disadvantaged people not, not having access to the, a computer or the internet and even if they did, the application process is very difficult for these people. And do you not think that the Minister should ensure that implied consent should be a part of the universal credit system to rectify yeah, yeah. some of these problems? She's right. There are, there are many, many issues with the system and digital exclusion is, is a huge one. Um, since, since obtaining the deflection script documents, I've had discussions with a former case manager on the helpline, Mr Tarpley, and... I talked about how the leaked script, um, how it comes across, and he, he explained to me that it only really hints at how much was expected of you as a call handler to deflect people online. He explained to me how if someone calls and asks to make a change over the phone, they would be told no by default. No matter what the reason the caller gives, whether that's disability, a bereavement, lack of digital skills, they'd always be asked the same questions. Do you have a mobile device? Do you have any friends or family that can help? And can you get to the library? They'd also be told to explain that there are computers at the job centre which can be used for free, which I've heard from constituents often when the job centre is very busy that, that that's not the case and they're not able to access that help. I will one last time. 
on, on, on an issue that's common, and the Minister knows these because I've written to him about the, about the issues. Uh, would the Honourable Lady not agree that with the murky way in which universal credit has worked out, uh, that at many times with staff members not even knowing the, 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 how access to the payment plan is made, they expect people to hold on on the hours for the phone uh, for the information, to then be told there is no information? Uh, Minister, uh, uh, the Honourable Lady should say first, but does the Honourable Lady agree that perhaps the Minister should be looking at, at making sure that the staff members are trained to the standard that the people need to get the answers that they need at the time that they need them? Very important point, and I will come on to staff and training further on in my remarks. Um, I, I, I find the, the, the burden on the staff to be a, a significant point as well. Bayer told me that we were trained to never help callers on the phone unless it was going to lead to a manager caller complaint. If you did make the change, there was a risk of failing a CEF check in which a manager would listen to the call and rate it based on several elements on the call with following the deflection script being part of that criteria. So we, we see that people, staff are being marked against deflecting people online. Some of this may now have changed, likely due to the coverage and media pressure, but given the government's absolute lack of transparency on this issue, it's unclear what's changed, how much has changed, and when those changes have or are likely to happen. So I hope that the Minister will be clear about those changes today. It's also astounding that this government thought it was an appropriate strategy in the first place, and it raises very serious questions, Mr Evans, about how little consideration is given to the experience of people. I imagine that in his response, the Minister may point to some of the different training that call handlers receive to assess and deal with vulnerable callers, but I've been tol told firsthand that call handlers are trained to do certain things, but that doesn't necessarily happen in practice. So how much of the training is actually being implemented by managers and are managers being told to do things differently and are they being monitored? Hearing about these strategies, it's no surprise then that there are many cases where people have not received the support that they need from the helpline. This jeopardises and delays people's payments and financial stability, at times having significant implications for mental and physical health, something that I see and I know that other members here today will see with their constituents and in their offices often. Earlier this year, I spoke to Sky News about the deflection scripts that were shown to me by whistleblowers. And Sky News, they, they covered this and they also highlighted the case of Brian. Brian was put on universal credit at the beginning of 2018 and in July he died by suicide. He was 59. His daughter Leanne spoke to Sky News and said he couldn't understand the system from the very start. He was told to go online and access his journal but he didn't have a clue about the internet. He was constantly ringing up and asking for advice but was just told to go online. It really got him down. And when she saw these deflection scripts, she, she couldn't believe that that was happening, but it rang true with the experience that her father had encountered. A constituent of mine used the helpline after questions in his journal went unanswered. The online system had seemed to fail him. And he was asking things, for example, why his money that he was entitled to wasn't coming through. And on multiple times that he called, he was told that his inquiry would be passed on and he would be phoned back. That didn't happen. And when contacting the UC helpline, the shortest hold time that he experienced was 20 minutes and the longest 42 minutes. That's been backed up by Citizens Advice, who found that at points the helpline has had an average waiting time of 39 minutes. My office has had to intervene on three occasions for this one constituent and for many others as well. But after intervening, my constituent believes that the problems have been resolved, but they wouldn't have been through his efforts alone. This cannot be right. It cannot be right that people are only treated with the respect that they deserve and given what they're entitled to when an MP's office or another agency intervenes. And it makes us ask, what about people who can't get to an MP's office? What about people who aren't able to access that extra help? What happens to them? And keeping in mind that these are some of the most vulnerable people in our society. So with that in mind, the ability to challenge decisions 
made on UC claims is particularly important. And in the context of recent research by the Child Poverty Action Group, which showed that one in five cases in a UC monitoring project involved administrative errors by the DWP, and those errors would result in a person claiming being paid with the wrong amount, perhaps. People face significant stress in not being able to manage the UC process, and this can have huge implications for family life. Exactly three months ago today, Mr Evans, Amber Rudd essentially admitted, the Secretary of State essentially admitted to Sky News that deflection had been a strategy used by the Universal Credit Helpline. She said, and I quote here, we're going to make sure it's absolutely clear in the future that there shouldn't be a deflection script strategy. And I have taken control to make sure that's the case. So whilst I welcome this change, I've, I've not heard anything about what, what will be happening, any changes. And it seems that since then, this issue has been somewhat swept under the carpet. So it's so important that we get these answers today. I've pursued the issue of deflection for months primarily because of the significant implications not being able to get help over the phone has on people's lives. Macmillan Welfare Rights Advisors have reported that people with cancer are often being redirected online. And they've also said there's inadequate training to cope with specific concerns of cancer patients on the helpline. One cancer patient claiming said, when I phone the numbers that they give me, they tell me they can't deal with it. This is causing me more stress than the cancer is. We can't have that as a situation. We can't have a situation where trying to get help, help that the government should be providing, is causing more stress on people's lives. The government have been evasive with me throughout the discussion on the use of deflection. They've fobbed off my FOI request, denied that deflection exists, even in the face of clear evidence. And they've made sure not to admit in the House that deflection has taken place. In fact, I'm still waiting on a reply uh, on my letter that I wrote on this subject to the Secretary of State on the 5th of February. We've had to rely on leaks and on whistleblowers to even hear that these tactics have been used and what effect that's having on people's lives. This lack of transparency seems to run throughout the system. The Child Poverty Action Group's report concluded the combination of poor decision making and a system that is not transparent about how decisions have been made is causing significant hardship on people's lives. But I want to make very clear before I finish Mr Evans that none of the criticisms of universal credit, of the way it's handled or of the helpline are aimed towards staff. Frontline DWP staff have some of the toughest jobs. They're under such intense pressure, and I believe they have a very genuine desire and care to help people. However, they're working within a broken system, and it is this system that must be criticised, condemned, and changed. A system where families are turning to food banks, working people are struggling to pay the bills, and people with severe disabilities are left without vital support. The General Secretary of PCS Union, who represents call centre workers said our members would prefer to be given the resources and time to give a first class service to help claimants. However, they're instructed to use this deflection script as a means to get people off the phones. It's another example of a government who's failed to invest in staff and support claimants. I will very quickly. Thank you very much. Does, and she's making an excellent case. Does she not agree that actually the Universal Credit Helpline is even more important because it's being used as backup for journal entries, which are supposed to be the way that claimants are able to get questions answered during their claim, but because staff, it's, uh, it's the third trigger of the amount of work that they have to do from zero, one and two that are priorities, that actually the helpline is picking up all these cases that should be answered by the journal, but there just aren't the staff to do that. Thank her very much. I, I know, as she will, and, and members, I, I'd say across um, the, the chamber today, but I'm very sad to see no backbench Conservatives here to, to listen or to intervene in this debate. It's, it's an experience that we're all very familiar with, uh, the journal letting people down, as does the helpline. So I, I want to ask some questions to the minister, which I hope he can answer in his remarks. Will he take this opportunity to be clear about what happened within the department that led to the development and implementation of a deflection script on, on the helpline? 
Will he now apologise to claimants who have not received the support that they deserve, often in times of great need, and to the whistleblowers that we have had to rely on to expose these damaging practices? Could he tell me if any changes have been made on the helpline since the Secretary of State said that there shouldn't be a deflection script strategy and that she had taken control to make sure that that was the case? And if so, what changes have been made and what evaluation was carried out to inform these changes? When will the changes be made or when have they been made, if that has happened? And specifically, what checks have been put in place to ensure that people receive the support that they need on the helpline and they're not deflected online? And could I ask him, does he really believe that the helpline is sufficiently resourced and run in the best interest of claimants in mind with staff being fully supported? Thank you very much, Mr Evans is that this House has considered the Universal Credit Helpline. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Evans. A pleasure to serve under your chairmanship in your debate. Uh, and uh, as we saw at the start of this debate, you are uh, char characteristically generous when dealing with, uh, with colleagues. Um, I also thank the, uh, the Honourable Lady for Midlothian uh, for raising this issue. I know she cares very deeply about this. She has uh, indeed written to me. Uh, and I apologise the response hasn't come yet. I did sign that letter uh, yesterday, so I hope she will get that in the next 24 hours. Um, but she's also raised this uh, in uh, parliamentary questions and indeed uh, in February at DWP Orals when I gave her a response. But I will come on to that. Um, let me start by setting out where we are in terms of universal credit right now, Mr Evans. So universal credit has rolled out to all job centres across the country last year. And we now have 1.8 million people uh, claiming this benefit. Um, and it's worth pointing out when we talk about support that over the last two budgets, we have announced changes to universal credit worth an additional £6 billion to ensure that in particular, vulnerable claimants are supported in the transition to universal credit. This, of course, includes changes to work allowances worth an extra £1.7 billion a year. And these changes, which increase work allowances by £1,000, were brought in from April this year providing a boost to the incomes of the lowest paid. This will result in 2.4 million families keeping an extra £630 per year of what they earn. And I hope what this does do is underline our learning and adapting uh, approach. Um, we've always been clear that Universal Credit is primarily a digital service that allows claimants to manage their own data and account online at a time that is convenient for them. Via their account, claimants can check their Universal Credit benefit payments notifiers of changes and uh, record notes via an online journal facility. There are still some activities that require a call from the claimant as they're not yet automated, such as booking an appointment, so the telephony channel remains an important part of our service offer. The Universal Credit Telephone helplines have been uh, free phone numbers since the end of 2017. Claimants who call the Universal Credit uh, helpline are connected directly to the person or team uh, who is dealing with their case. We also have dedicated national service hubs who provide telephony for third parties, such as landlords and welfare rights, uh, and those citizens without a claim. For those unable to access or use digital services, and I think this is an important point, assistance to make and maintain their claim is available via the free phone Universal Credit Helpline. The Universal Credit Service Centre will establish the best means of support for the claimant. We also provide comprehensive support for claimants without digital skills or who do not have access to a computer. Support is provided in person in job centres and through the computers that are available for claimants to use, as well as home visits for those unable to attend a job centre. From April of this year, we have introduced a help to claim service delivered by Citizens Advice. This provides additional support for any claimant from point of entry to first award of universal credit and is available by phone, web chat, and in person at local citizens advice outlets and job centres. DWP staff servicing the universal credit helplines have a three-week facilitated learning period. The Honourable Lady asked about training. Um, this is structured uh, learning uh, and provides the skills and knowledge required to support them to answer claimants' queries. For new staff, the learning journey for universal credit helpline call handlers is broadly made up of soft skills, uh, customer service learning, which covers how to gather information through active listening, uh, equality and diversity training, and bespoke IT system-based technical learning, all of which is supported by consolidation activity. 
Colleagues alongside experienced case managers uh, receive ongoing learning in their roles and have access to universal credit guidance, which is refreshed at regular intervals. We are committed to continuous improvement, and as part of this, we regularly review core plans, service levels, and intelligence to improve our offer and understand why claimants are calling. Yes, of course. Kevin Way. He will know, perhaps, that a job centre employee described universal credit as like being in a leaky boat. The holes spring up and someone sticks their finger in and a new hole appears and they end up sprawled across the boat trying to block all the leaks. The holes aren't the problem, though. It's the boat. He will know that many people, many groups in civil society, believe that universal credit should be paused. Will he not think about pausing this so that all the holes in the boat can be fixed? Uh, generally to the Honourable Lady, I do visit job centres, as indeed do my ministerial colleagues, um, and that is not the feedback that we're receiving from people on the front line. Uh, in terms of pausing universal credit, I think we've been clear that we have now rolled out universal credit across the country since December last year, and it is the main welfare provision in our country going forward. Um, but if I may just return, uh, Mr Evans, to the point about the, the, the helpline. Um, when someone calls the Universal Credit Helpline, they're presented with a series of options to select from. They will then be put through to the agent best place to answer their inquiry. All further triage is done through conversation to establish the claimant's needs. There are 26 service centres across the country aimed at supporting people with a Universal Credit claim. We have between 5,000 to 7,500 staff answering calls in our service centres to support our customers. Um, and this is an important point in terms of statistics around this, but I wouldn't want any member to be in any doubt that um, we are not making a big effort when it comes to supporting people over the phone. So in March 2019, we answered around 1.3 million calls to the Universal Credit Full Service Helpline. Um, and the Honourable Lady uh, talked uh, about uh, waiting times. I can tell her that in March 2019, the average waiting time uh, to answer a, a call was 2 minutes 43 seconds and um, uh, in February uh, the duration of an average call time to the UC helpline was just over 6 minutes. I, I hope you'll appreciate that this isn't about rushing people off the lines, this is about providing support to them. Um, the uh, Honourable Lady, as I said earlier, uh, Mr Evans, also raised this issue in parliamentary questions on the 11th of February in DWP oral questions. Uh, and I just want to reiterate what I said to her then, uh, which is that um, she has already been sent a copy of the Universal Credit Digital Channel document. Uh, she talked about uh, FOI requests. She already has that. And this is what the Department uh, for Work and Pension Staff use as a guide when talking uh, taking calls from claimants. She will be aware that this document says clearly that staff must use a common sense and sensitive approach in resolving queries ahead of any digital discussion. And I want to be absolutely clear once again with her, there is no intention to deflect and there are no targets for getting claimants to use a digital channel. Um, a number of other points were uh, raised uh, by the Honourable Lady. She talked about uh, supporting those uh, who perhaps struggle with, uh, with English or indeed uh, Welsh. Um, I can tell her that um, we have an interpreting service available for those with language barriers. Uh, the uh, Honourable Member for uh, Strangford uh, raised an issue about uh, people being held on the phone and not uh, being given an answer. Of course, we regularly uh, review service levels on the UC helpline to improve our offer and to make improvements. If we can't answer a question, we will call the claimant uh, back. Um, and uh, the, uh, yes, yes, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, the minister just said that the universal credit helpline is not there, that you're not trying to direct people onto digital platforms necessarily. But the complaints procedure for universal credit cannot be undertaken by phone. People are simply uh, directed online to make a complaint online. So those who struggle with online access are unable to do the very basics of making a complaint where they've got a problem with either online or the helpline. Um, how does that square with, uh, with his commitment that people are not being directed online? And will he make sure that people can make a complaint over the phone, please? Well, I just say to you, 
Honourable Lady, is that when a conversation takes place uh, between uh, a WP staff member and a, a claimant, uh, of course there is a, a conversation and there is an opportunity for the staff member to answer the, 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 the question. Uh, she, th there are uh, established procedures, uh, procedures when people want to raise complaints, uh, and as she herself knows, uh, she takes a deep interest in these matters. Um, if any of her constituents ever have such an issue, uh, she will write to me, and I understand that, and it's absolutely incumbent on us as ministers to make sure we provide a, a response. Uh, but I would just say to her that in terms of statistics that I put out there, uh, I hope what she will appreciate is that uh, DWP staff make a huge effort in answering phone calls and dealing with them uh, sensitively. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Evans, uh, one of the other issues that was, uh, was raised indeed for the Honourable Lady for, for High Peak was uh, about uh, um, journal entries. And I just want to be clear that the journal is available 24-7 for claims to communicate uh, with their work coach, uh, which was not available under the, the legacy system. Um, so, in conclusion, Mr. Evans, DWP colleagues are fully committed to supporting claimants through a range of channels, and clearly we are making progress in the support we provide. In our latest claimant survey, published in January 2019, four out of five people were satisfied with the support they'd received when claiming universal credit, and this is broadly consistent with satisfaction levels in legacy benefits. Satisfaction levels are also high, and the vast majority of claimants who use the telephony system found staff to be helpful and uh, polite. Uh, of course, I completely acknowledge that we want and we need to continue to make progress and improve uh, matters further so that everyone claiming universal credit gets the support that they rightly deserve. And once again, I say in conclusion, Mr. Evans, that if there are individual cases that colleagues want to raise with me, I hope what they, I hope what they will find when they've dealt with me is that I have been open, uh, as a department we're open, and when we make mistakes, we acknowledge them. The question is that this House has considered Universal Credit Helpline, as many as are of that opinion say aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. This sitting is suspended until 4.30 p.m. <laughs>